he mentioned. We hope uh, that this is the last time this will be a fast day, Be'ez Rosh Hashem, uh, next year. And even before Tisha B'Av, these days will become days of Sasain and Simcha. Again, and a lot of that will be in the Zuchus of both learning Torah and to bring other Jews to Torah. Uh, the idea that uh, we have a responsibility to help other Jews find and discover Torah and mitzvahs is not automatically pushed. Some say, well, I, I, I got to keep mitzvahs. He has to keep mitzvahs, but if he has a problem with that, uh, no, what's, uh, what, what is my particular issue? But all of the Svarim HaKadoshim point out how Kira V'chaikim on some level is actually a, a chiyav that comes from a lot of sources. Uh, first and most basic, it's an expression of Avas Yisrael. If Avas Yisrael, V'hafti L'recha Kamaycha, I care about somebody. So I give them a drink when it's hot, I give them food, I make my home available. Kal V'chaimer, Kal V'chaimer, if I could help them get Olam Haba to connect to the Rebbeinu Shalaylam. So on the most basic level, Kira V'chaikim is a very, very high Kiyam HaMitzvah of Avas Yisrael. To put it in the negative, the Torah says in Vayikra, in Parshas Kedashim, Leisamad al damreyacha, do not stand by idly over your friend's blood. So I'm a to help save a person from wild animals if I'm able to do it, or whatever it would be. Once again, it's a Kal V'chaimer. What type of Sakana is greater? than a sakana of ruchnius, where a person does not connect to what his destiny is, if I'm mechayiv to extricate him, to help him with a flat tire, or whatever it is, kal v'chaymer, to help a person find Hashem. So both in terms of the kiyam of Avas Yisrael, which is the positive, and in terms of the negative of l'samet al-dam I am mechayiv to be involved, to try to help people come to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in various ways. Exactly how I do it, uh, that depends. Not everybody will necessarily be a professional teacher, but by having guests over, by, by living a life of Kiddush Hashem, so even in the workplace, so that people who may not be Shomer Mitzvahs will say, gee, I, I noticed this person is unusually Erlich and Menschlichkeit. That's also uh, the way we're Makarov people in many, many different, in different ways. The Rambam writes in Sefer HaMitzvahs, that Kira V'chaikim is an union of Avas Hashem. Not just Avas Yisrael, it's Avas Hashem. Because if you truly love HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then you want HaKadosh Baruch Hu to have nachas from as many possible people that he can. You love God, then you go out and you bring other people to God because God gets no greater joy than to have his children come back to him. You're bringing Hashem's children back to him. That's Avas Hashem. And not just Avash Yisrael, it's Avash Hashem. We also know that Chazal teach us, Kol Yisrael Arev and Zelazah, every Jew is responsible for another Jew. Now this is not, this is not just a nice statement, uh, this has a concrete halachic meaning, and the halacha would be familiar to many of you. The Mishnah says in Rosh Hashanah, the Mishnah lays down a very important rule, Kol She'einu Mechayiv B'davar, what does that mean? If I'm not chayiv in a mitzvah, I cannot do it for somebody else. I can't be mighty a person in a mitzvah if I'm not mechayiv. So for example, a katan, a, a child below bar mitzvah, cannot make kiddush for his mother because she's chayiv in kiddush. He's not chayiv in kiddush. He can't be mighty her. A goy cannot blow shayfer or make kiddush, even though in Eretz Yisrael you have plenty of goyim who you know, speak Hebrew, you know, better than most of us speak Hebrew, but a goy is not mechayiv, right? If you're not mechayiv, you can't be mighty. That's a fundamental rule. A woman cannot blow shayfer for a man, because a woman is not chayevus in tekiah shayfer, because it's a mitzvah saseh shazman garama. Now, in spite of the fact that kol she'enu mechayiv b'davar e'enu mochi achem y'day chayvasan, by kiddush, for example, even if I made Kiddush for myself and I was Yaitse Kiddush, I can make Kiddush for my wife, I can make Kiddush for a guest, I could make Kiddush again and again and again and again. Now you may ask Akasha, how is it Shaykh for me to make Kiddush again for somebody if I was already Yotse? I don't have a chiyav to make Kiddush. I'm not a Mechayiv Bedavar. If I'm not a Mechayiv Bedavar, how could I be Maitse? So Rashi in Rosh Hashanah says, that the reason I can make Kiddush for you, even if I was a Yaitse already, Mamish Lagamri Yaitse, is Kol Yisrael Arev and Zelazah. 
since I am responsible for you, if you didn't hear Kiddush yet, I still have not fulfilled my obligation. So Rashi says, Kol Yisrael Arev and Zelazah means if there's any Jew in the world that hasn't done his mitzvah, I still have an obligation that was not satisfied. And that's why I can make Kiddush for the guest who shows up, and then another guest who shows up, and another guest, Ein Ladover Saif, because Arvus, Kol Yisrael Arev and Zelazah makes me a Bar Chiyuva, uh, the Ramak, of Moshe Kardivero, and the beautiful Sefer, Timer Devira, that everybody should uh, learn, especially during Elul, but it's, it's a beautiful Sefer the whole year, where he talks about emulating the 13 Midas of Rachamim that Hashem has, and thereby triggering them. Actually says, Kabbalistically, the aside of Kal Yisrael Arev and Zelazah is that each Neshama of a Yid has pieces of every other Neshama of a Yid. So, in my neshama are the pieces of all of your neshamas. In your neshama is my neshama. In other words, therefore, if Yid number million and one didn't hear Kiddush, there's a chisarin in my neshama. My neshama has not connected to Hashem completely on that level. So the notion that, hey, I'm from, and what happens to him is none of my business, unfortunately, even from a selfish perspective, it's not emes. It's like the famous mushal that Talmud Yerushalmi gives of people sitting on a boat, and there's a hole in the boat uh, under the seat of one of the people, and I want to fix the hole, and that person who's sitting here, don't you know, get away from here, this is my seat, what is it, your business? The answer is, the whole boat is going to, is going to sink. Uh, that's Kol Yisrael, Raven Zelazah, we are Guguf Echad, and the like. So the notion, the Chiyav, the Achrayas of Kiruv Rechaikim is something that's very, very well understood, but again, let me point out, that it can take many, many different forms. I mean, I'm not you know, here to tell you that everybody should give up their, whatever their job is, and apply for a teaching position in Or Sameach or Eshat Torah. Uh, at least I guess Or Sameach, I can, I can guarantee we really don't have that many positions open. So the issue is not, you gotta give up everything. Kirov, again, in many, many ways, you just have to care. You have to care, you have to put it on your agenda. It has to be something that you are concerned about. So whether it's a chavrusa through Partners in Torah, which is a wonderful, wonderful organization where you can literally just online say, hey, I want to teach somebody Chumash. And they'll make a shidduch with you and somebody who said they want to learn Chumash and the like. Uh, whether it's having hachnasas orchim, whether it's learning, coming to learn some echbeis medrash or, you know, and just making a chavrusa with somebody that's a little weaker or someone that's, that's a beginning. Uh, many, many different ways of doing it. But the point is, you can't ignore it. You have to consider it something that I, as a Jew, am responsible for. And indeed, to go back to the Rambam's point, that, that Kira Verchaikim is not only an aspect of Avas Yisrael, but it's also an aspect of Avas Hashem. Uh, you actually see this from a very beautiful insight that the Chassam Seifer says uh, in uh, the Hakdama uh, to Yeridea, the Chuvas in Yeridea, where he points out of all of the Avais, only Avram Avinu is called by Hashem, Avram Ohavi, Avram who loves me. You know, even Yitzhak and Yaakov are not given the appellation uh, Ohava, Ohavi, those who love me. So the Chassam Seifer says, because what was Avram Avinu? Avram Avinu was essentially, we would call him the first Kirib worker. Uh, his tent was open to Ov the Avodazara. He even prayed for Sodom and Amora to try to, he thought there was some potential there, even to the extent of arguing with the Rabbanish Alaylam. So Avram Avinu devoted his life to teaching the world about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and, a, and a world in which most people thought he was crazy or most people thought he was fanatic. But through his kindness and his achnosas orchim and the care that he had, he eventually brought many, many, many people to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the Chassam Sefer says, if Avram Avinu was only concerned with his own madrega in Ruchnias, surely he could have made a cheshpin. Why, why am I getting involved with these uh, over there by the Zara? I will sit, I will learn, I will daven, I will meditate, I will be dovok in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and I will separate myself from this world. Like, why do I need this world? Why do I have to be dragged down? But Avram Avinu was willing to even give up some of his own bruchnias in order to glorify the name of Hashem in the eyes of others. So says the Chassam Seiper, Avram Oavi, he loved me because he wasn't in it for himself. He was even mavater on certain kinyonim he could have had in order to make the Shem Hashem beloved 
in the eyes of others. And the Chassam Sefer says, that is what is called Mesiris Nefesh. You know, we normally uh, define Mesiris Nefesh as I'm willing to endanger my life for Hashem. No, that's Mesiris Aguf. You're giving up your body. Mesiris Nefesh is even when you're willing to be Mavater on Ruchnis. Now, this Chassam Sefer is a very important Yisait, but, 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 you have to take it with a great, great deal of caution and do not be premature in making that jump. A uh, person might say, a person might be you know, learning in yeshiva for three months and say, ah, oh, I'm going to give up you know, my learning because I'm going to go out and I'm going to be makariv. That would be a tragic mistake in many, many ways because until you have a lot of taira to give, Rav Aaron Kutler used to give the famous mashal of a kiddush cup overflowing, that the cup overflows and then it fills up the little bechers, the little cups around it. It has to be. You can't be a makarev. You can't be a mashpia, at least um, in, a, in a public sense, in a widespread sense, until you yourself have absorbed a lot of Torah and Ruchnias. So yes, at some point in your life, you go out and you're willing to give up some of your time, some of your energy, some of your own learning in order to be makadesh shem shemayim. I mean, every, every Rosh Hashiv, really, every Magid Shir, I mean, even even Kirov Rechaikim, in a sense, is giving up some of the learning they might have done on their own. And they do it to be Makadesh Shem Shemayim. But you got to be careful not to do it too early. You do it too early, there's going to be a bit of a problem because there's not enough to give. <laughs> you have to have a lot inside in order to be able to give. However, even, even in the context of the yeshiva, you're learning in yeshiva, there's still Kirov Rechaikim that you can do. You're in a place like Orsameach, right? So uh, you've been in Orsameach a month. You can help the guy that's been here for a day. You know, there are things that you know, that you learned, that maybe the person didn't learn. So yeah, there's still an union of Kirov Rechaikim, even on whatever level you're on. But as I say, beware of cutting off your connection uh, to your full-time learning and the like. But this is what the Chassam Seifer says, that Avram Oave, Avram was willing to be Mavater, even his Ruchnias, in order to be Mekadosh Shem Shemayim. Uh, they tell a story about the Chazanish. Now the Chazanish uh, was in Vilna till, uh, till around his late 40s, early 50s. And in Vilna, he was very, very anonymous. In fact, the Sefer Chazanish, the first Chelek or Rechaim, was anonymous. Chazanish is Avram Yeshaya, but nobody knew who wrote it except a few people. Rav Chaim Meiser knew, for example. But the Chazanish was a very, very private person. He basically was learning. Um, I think like for a month he became an acting rav somewhere. Someone went on summer vacation. But 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 the Chazanish didn't want to be a rav, didn't want to be a rosh shiva, didn't want to be a magid shir. Uh, he did tutoring. He, he, you know, he learned with, with people. In fact, Chaim Grader, the famous uh, Yiddish writer, who unfortunately uh, was not a shomer mitzvah, but he was tutored by the Chazanish. His uh, mother was an almana. And, she got Avram Yeshaya to tutor her. And uh, for all of his life, he had a tremendous uh, love for the Chazanish that he, that he wrote about uh, and the like. But the Chazanish was a nister par excellence. Now, as we know, when he came to Eretz Yisrael, he already was a mature person. His life changed. He became a very, very public person who was involved in every aspect of religious life in Eretz Yisrael. Chazanish is almost, all, I mean, if you have to pick somebody, the Chazanish is basically almost the father of the Haredi world. Chazanish and the Briskarov are the two pillars. I mean, there were many others, but these are the two big pillars. So the Chazanish used to say that what made him change from private to public, he says he went to hear a shmooze by the Chavetz Chaim. And the Chavetz Chaim was talking about the fact that he says, you know, you think it's such a big deal if you learn by yourself and you're all by yourself, you become a Gadol Batayra. He says, what's the big deal? And then the Chavitz Chaim says, even I, he said, could have become a gadol had I not been so involved in helping other people. Even I could have become a gadol. So <laughs> what's the big deal? And the, and the Chavitz Chaim says, in a door where so many people have left Tyra, you can no longer have the luxury of just concentrating on your spiritual growth. You have to have an achrayas for Klal Yisrael. And Kedarka, many people say like this, they had certain issues they wanted to talk about with the Chafetz Chaim, and the Chafetz Chaim just happened to talk about that very topic in a public uh, speech. You know, they didn't even have to have a meeting with the Chafetz Chaim. The Chafetz Chaim answered the question. And the Chazanish said that that was my terrace. That was, to me, that was a simon min shamayim that I have to do this. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter said, you know, uh, in Lita at the time, this is earlier, 
this is the middle of the 1800s, the middle of the 19th century, there were people who were called Prussian. Actually, they were hermits. They would actually go into the forest for a whole uh, week. Uh, they would learn in isolation. They would learn. They would daven. Maybe they would come home every Shabbos to be with their mishpacha. Maybe they wouldn't. Uh, it was mamish a way of separating from the havle, Eilam hazah, to focus on their ruchnias. Rabbi Saul Salanter was very, very attracted to that derech, a derech of removing yourself from the world, not being involved in the Gashmias of Olam Hazah, not getting involved in all of the different movements that are happening, and you know, Zionism and Haskala and reform, I mean, all these different, get, get away from the Shtusim. Focus on my Avaidah. He was very attracted to it. This was the derech that he wanted, and there were role models. There were, there were Chashav Yidin who lived that way. But then he said, but what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to just neglect or condemn, you know, 80% of Am Yisrael or whatever it would be to drowning? I just care about putting on my fur coat. It's like you're in a cold room. It's Sadiq Mitzapels. It's a Yiddish expression. You're in a cold room. Everybody's cold. So one way of, help of doing it is you try to uh, uh, raise the heat. The other way is you put on a coat. Nafkamina is when I put on a coat, I'm warm and you're still cold. I raise the heat, I try to help everybody. Rabbi Saul Flanter said, how could I just forget about everybody else? How could I? I don't have the luxury. So once again, this is a chilek of Avas Yisrael, Hatzala leisamad al dam reyecha, Avas Hashem. And mystically, ultimately, it's my pagam too. If, if someone is not serving Hashem, my pagam is, uh, call Yisrael Arevin Zelazah, that part of my neshama is in those every Jew that is, uh, that is out there. Now, so it's also Yadua, it's well known that there are many side benefits of, kira, of, of being involved in Kira Vrachaik, and that is, Baruch Hashem, we often get inspired ourselves. You know, sometimes you've been from for a long time, either an FFB from, from birth, or you've just been from for a very long time. We sometimes lose momentum. We sometimes lose enthusiasm. We've been doing it so long. It's no longer a new thing for us. As, and Chazal tell us, B'chol yom v'yom, yu be'necha kechadoshim. Every single day it has to be new and fresh. But how can I make it new and fresh? I've been doing it a hundred years. Ah, but I see it through the eyes of someone that is coming to it for the first time. And they have enthusiasm. They can have geschmack. And that rubs off on me. I can gain a tremendous amount from the interest and excitement that maybe I had years ago. But maybe it's left me as, you know, get older. But Baruch Hashem, it's a chance to have that rekindled. So a person has to know that it's not simply a matter of what you're giving to people, as important as that is. It's also a matter of what you're getting. You're also getting, you're getting inspiration. And you're getting new perspectives. I mean, listen, um, you work uh, with Jews who are not totally religious. Okay, Beseder. But they're bright, they're educated. In some areas, they may know a lot more than the rabbi that's teaching them in, 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 in a particular area. So it's not a one-way street. It's not a one-way street by any means. It's not a one-way street in terms of inspiration. And it's not even a one-way street in terms of knowledge that you know, a rabbi, a teacher can understand. Anyone can understand a lot more about their Torah by virtue of the insights and the Havana that somebody can bring, bring to it. Which is why it's actually very, very important in Kirov that it never be presented as a one-way street. Sometimes there's an idea in Kirov, I mean, I've even, it's a caricature, but I, I think over the years uh, I have memories of people sometimes talking this way, Baruch not in Orsameach, kind of, but more or less along the lines, hey, you know, you're a nobody, you're a nothing, but I'm here to make your life worthwhile. I'm going to give you wisdom that will take you from the worthless materialistic existence that you're living in to something significant. You know, frankly, I mean, sometimes that might be true, I admit, sometimes. But frankly, that's very patronizing. It's very condescending. And, you know, somebody who worked hard in their lives to be whatever it is, a lawyer, a doctor, or whatever it is, you know, they've done something. It's not like they have no accomplishments, they have no worth, they have no value. Rather, it has to be a, a shutfus. It has to be the notion, we're here to grow together. There are things I can help you with that you, you may not have access to, and there are things you can help me with. And let, me, let me understand. And when there's a mutuality, there is respect. 
When there's respect, there can be love, and then we can grow together. It's not the patronizing thing of, hey, I'm up here and you're down there, and I'm going to, you know, noblesse, noblesse oblige, I'm going to kind of, you know, give you everything. There has to be a, a sharing of it. There has to be the notion that it's not even a Rebbe and a Talmud, although formally it might be, but it's like Chaveirim that are coming together to grow in their Yiddishkeit. That is really, in fact, that's when the Torah, the Torah talks about Teichacha, you know, correcting or chastising. It says, Hocheach tochiach es amisecha, es. Demonstrate the Torah with es, with, it doesn't say la, it doesn't say give muster to somebody. Hocheach tochiach, let us try to clarify. For the word hochacha, by the way, doesn't even mean chastisement. It means to clarify, to demonstrate. Hocheach, demonstrate the Torah with Reyecha, your friend. I mean, look at every word there. Demonstrate, clarify, with, not to, your friend. Every word in the Pasuk implies a certain approach that we have towards, uh, towards the Kiruv, the Kiruv Rechaikin. And that's really the, uh, the only way that works. I mean, practically, that's the only way that works, but spiritually as well, you have to recognize uh, the goodness in every yid. You know, the Ramban writes in Igeris Ramban that any time you meet somebody, you should try to identify a quality in them that you can admire and that you can emulate. He says it's an exercise. Look around, look at the person. What can you admire about this person? And then the Ramban says, if he went through different matzavim and is maybe not as religious as you, ask yourself the question, if I would have been in those situations, how would I have turned out? Maybe it wouldn't have, you know, maybe I would have been worse than that person is. I remember years, years ago, um, I was uh, teaching a, a shear in Columbia, Maryland. And in, that, in those days, Columbia, Maryland, uh, it was a model city, going back to the city, it was a model city, and they weren't allowed to have houses of worship because they couldn't have a shul, they couldn't have a church because that was sectarian. So instead they had what were called multi-faith houses in which every religion could come in, but they didn't want, any, they didn't want anything miyuchad. That would be sectarian. So there wasn't even Chabad. Now there's Chabad in Colombia somehow, you know, it changed over the years, but there was like nothing in Colombia. But I, I, I was somehow giving a shear there to people who were not uh, observant in any way. And I, I said what I said. And afterwards a, a woman went over to me and she prefaced her remark by saying, I'm not as religious as you, but I don't even remember what she asked. But what I said to her then, I, th I think Baruch Hashem, Hashem put the good words in my mouth. He says, why do you say you're not as religious as me? Maybe there are mitzvot or commandments that I do that you don't do, but there, there are many, many things you do. Maybe you, you honor your parents more than me. Maybe you're more meticulous in your speech. Maybe, uh, I mean, I use the English, uh, your midos are better. It's not a question more religious, less religious. All of us have milas. All of us has chesronas. We have to learn from each other. We have to grow from each other. And that is how Kira becomes effective when it becomes uh, a notion of a shared experience of growth through, through Torah learning and through Torah, through Torah living. Here, I want to just mention the Lubavitcher Rebbe didn't even like the term Kirov Rechaikim. You know, somebody said he works with Kirov Rechaikim. So the Baba Rebbe said, why do you say rechaikim? Why do you imply that somebody is far from God? Every Yid is close to Hashem. Livnei Yisrael am karevai, but they don't know it yet. So it's not kirav rechaikim. He's already a karev. You have to be magala to him that there's korva. But then the Rebbe switched gears and turned the knife a little bit and said, anyway, how do you know who's a karev and who's a rechaikim? I mean, maybe, maybe that person is more of a karev than you because Hashem judges us based on the circumstances of our lives. So even if I'm doing more stuff, but maybe lefi my madrega, I should be much, much higher. The Mabit gives an example in Beis HaLukim. I don't know if my numbers are exact, but this is the surah of the mushal. Let's say you had a person who was an Eloi. He could learn a hundred blot of Gemara a day. A hundred blot of Gemara a day, amazing. And he only does 50, which is still amazing. And another guy has to work a whole week for one blot. So I look at two people, I see somebody learning 50 blot, and I say, what, an Eloi? And the other guy, oh, never, okay, I know he works hard. In Hashem's book, it's the opposite. 
the guy, the Mabit says, the guy who learns one blood is giving the Abishir 100% of his kaychas. And the guy that's learning 50 blood is giving the Abishir 50% of his kaychas. In Ruchnius, the guy learning one blood is in a higher madrega. As they zuck the Mabit in the base of the So Mamela, who's a Karav, who's a Rachak? How do you know? I remember years ago, um, <laughs> I was involved, I was already married, don't worry about it, but I was involved with NCSY, with uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Lohan of Ranzach Honel of Racha, who was a dear, dear friend of mine in, in Baltimore. And uh, if any of you have ever been to NCSY, uh, again, I was married already, so there was no, you know, he didn't have some of the problems that single boys might have. Uh, but Motze Shabbos, they have a kumzitz in the dark, and people get up and they talk about their stories. We used to call it True Confession Night. So I remember there was a, a girl there, a teenage girl, who got up, uh, Motzei Shabbos, and uh, she started saying that not only are her parents not Shomer Shabbos, her parents don't let her keep Shabbos when she's home. And she described the ritual that she does Friday night when her parents are there. She says she has to wait till 11 o'clock at night when her parents go to sleep. She goes into the bathroom. She takes out Shabbos candles that she hides somewhere. She lights the Shabbos candles in the bathroom. She then blows them out and turns on the fan. Uh, so the smoke you know, will be dispersed. Now, the truth of the matter is, we could get, maybe Orla Gala, we can give a smicha b'china, identify how many Averos were committed in this pa'ula. The Chilol Shabbos, so many malachas, and the bracha in the bathroom, and bracha levatela. I mean, a million, a million things. But who knows? Who knows? She didn't know the halachas. She was living in an environment where she couldn't keep Shabbos at all. And in her ignorance, she wants to reach out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and do something. Is it Yitachim? That Hashem looks at that and simply says, ah, Averis, uh, nothing, nothing, go Gehenna. I don't know. Again, no, no, we're not Nevi'im, we can't say. But Rachman al that the heart of a person counts for, for a lot. Now, yes, Rav Chaim Velazhner writes in the Nefesh Chaim that you can't use that cheshben not to keep halach. A person can't say, oh, my heart is a serve Hashem, so I'd rather say Shema at 11 in the afternoon, 11 instead of Zman Kriya Shema. Avada, that's a krum cheshben. But it's a krum cheshben when you know the halach and you say, oh, my kavan is more important. That's what Rav Chaim Velazhner is negating. But if a person, Pasha, doesn't know, and this is the way they wanted to serve Hashem. Who knows? Who knows who's on a higher madrega? You never, you never know. And again, in our, in our Kiro Rechaikim, we have to be involved this way. Um, you know, they tell the story about the Chafetz Chaim. Again, many stories about the Chafetz Chaim. And this is a famous story. And people, I mean, it's a famous story. So, uh, I mean, I, I heard this story when I was a Bachar in Yeshiva uh, 50 years ago. So people then ask me, what's the mucker of a story? You know, some, some stories are just stories. I, I don't know if there's a mucker and you, know, you don't know. And I can't give you any guarantee that they're true. But it could have happened. Right? This is a story that could have exemplified the Chavitz Chaim about um, a rabbi was speaking, uh, maybe, uh, you know, 50 years ago. And uh, he heard a story about the, uh, he heard a story about the Chavitz Chaim that there was a bucher that was smoking in Raden and he had to go to the Chafetz Chaim, and the Chafetz Chaim saw the Bachar for around one minute, and the Bachar walked out and was a changed man, changed person. So the rabbi said, if I only knew what the Chafetz Chaim said to that Bachar, I would have the secret of motivation. I wish I knew. So the story goes that from the back of the audience, a very old man with a walker laboriously got up and said, Ani Hagever, I am that man, I was that boy. This never happened to me like that, but the, the person who's the Baal Hamaisa gets up. So it's amazing. The man is already like in his 90s, you know, a really old man at that point. So he says, what happened with the Chafetz Chaim? So he says, well, first of all, he says, I was 15 year old, and I, I, was, I was basically Shomer Mitzvahs, but, but you know, the uh, Sahara, I smoked whatever, whatever it was, and I got caught, and I was told, I have to go to the Chafetz Chaim. Now, we don't necessarily realize how scary that was. You know, the Chafetz Chaim was not like 
the Rosh Hashiva you saw every day. The Chavitz Chaim at that point wasn't even coming to Yeshiva that much. He was like a presence, like the Kodesh HaKadoshim. He wasn't even officially, he wasn't officially Rosh Hashiva, he wasn't officially Mashkiach, he wasn't officially anything, he just was the Kayach. So the guy said, listen, I should be more, I, more frightened of the Rebani Shalom than even the Chavitz Chaim, but whatever it was, Rebani Shalom, for whatever reason, I didn't have the same feeling. But the Chavitz Chaim, I was shaking, I was terrified. And I walk in to the Chavitz Chaim's house, and the Chavitz Chaim was very short. I was already, as a 15-year-old, I was already taller. And, the Chavitz Chaim. and he's bent over and he looks up at me and I see tears, tears in the sharp blue eyes that the Chavitz Chaim had. And he took my hand and he held my hand tight and the tears from his eyes fell on my hand. I felt them like a fire that I still feel to this very day. And the Chavitz Chaim just said to me, Shabbos, Shabbos, Shabbos. And I saw in the Chavitz Chaim two things. I saw the tremendous pain that he had over Chilul Shabbos and the tremendous pain he had for my neshama and the love that he had for my neshama. And then I was able to figure out, gee, this is how the Rebani Shalom feels, multiply it by infinity. And I said, how could I... How could I bring Shatsar to the Chafiz Chaim? How could I bring Shatsar to the Rebani Shalom? That changed my life. That changed my life. By somebody showing me that they cared about me, that they loved me, that they, they were so worried about my neshama, and they cared so much about the Torah itself. That changes me. That changed me. Now, there is a part two to the story. Part two is, the Bacha was kicked out of Yeshiva. He had to leave. So as he's leaving, the Chafiz Chaim says to him, where are you going? He says, well, Rebbe, you just told me to leave yeshiva. He says, you have to leave yeshiva. You can't be with other bachrim. It's a bad hashpah, but you stay in my house. Stay in my house. I'll learn with you. Now, people always have a problem with that, my son. I mean, this, is, this is what Chazal called chaytei nisker. All the masmidim in Radin, they don't get a seder with the Chavitz Chaim. A guy smokes on Shabbos, he gets to learn with the Chavitz Chaim. Like, you know, why should he, why should he get that tzuchos? But the answer is, it's not so pushish to have a Seder with the Chafetz Chaim. You gotta be on time, no Lashon Hara, of course. Uh, you know, it's, 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 kinda, it's kind of hard. It's not as easy, you know. People say, wow, what a cover that I have a Seder with the Chafetz Chaim. No, I mean, it's, it's you know, 100% learning, uh, whatever. But, um, so, so what the Chafetz Chaim was demonstrating is that even if you're an Avarian, even if you're doing things wrong, that doesn't mean I don't care about you. I gotta worry about everybody else, but I care about you too. With Rav Steinman, Zichroinu Lebracha. We had a, a situation like this in which um, it became a famous, a famous video in which uh, Talmud Torah and B'nai Brak didn't want to accept uh, an Almana's children because they said she was totally from it. She was a little more modern than, uh, than most of the families. And they felt that little bit of modernity would, uh, whatever, it'd be a negative effect. So Steinman, uh, who of course was the most mildest of, of people, was visibly angry. He says, you know, in Brisk, when I went to Cheder, we went with non-religious people. Every, you know, everybody went to the same Cheder. The Briskarov went to the Cheder with uh, people who were not even keeping shop. There was no concept that, you know, you have to separate yourself from everybody. And then when they started saying, yeah, but it's a bad environment, you have Sviva. So he said, uh, it's Gaiva, it's Gaiva, it's Gaiva, it's your Gaiva that you can't connect to other types of Jews. It's a malgaiva, it's an arrogance. And then he said, where do you want her to send your children? To the moon? Are there chadarim on the moon? That's what he said. As far as I know, they're not there yet. Okay, so that's um, act one of the story. This too has two acts. They play in two acts. So finally, Rav Steinman shrugged his shoulders because, you know, things are what they are. I mean, in Lamaisa, in Eretz Yisrael, Befrat, but in America too. We have chadarim, we have standards. You know, this is what it is. So Rav Steinman yielded to the inevitable. But as they were walking out, listen to this, as they were walking out, he asked them, what's the Bukhar's name? And they said, we don't know his name. He says, you mean you don't daven for him? You don't allow a Bukhar to go into your school? Okay, you have your cheshman. You just forget about him? You, you don't say capital to heal him? 
that HaKadosh Baruch Hu give Maslacha? How could you not even know his name? This is actually a phenomenal story. Because what it says is, I mean, every Rosh Hashiva, every Magachir, every, every institution has to deal with this. Sometimes institutions have to make decisions to exclude people for various reasons. Because we have an achrayas, not so much to the institution, although I, I know people, some people describe it that way, but we have an achrayas to the Talmidim of the institution for sure, that you know, they shouldn't be negatively influenced. But that doesn't mean you don't care about the outcast. You just have to find another miscarriage in which the person, and I can tell you, I know, personally, there are Rabbeim in Ar Sameach. And Baruch Hashem, this is a tremendous, tremendous thing, in which after a bacher was asked to leave for various reasons, they maintained a telephone chavur, they maintained a kesher, they maintained a chavur. So you have to leave, whatever the reason. But that doesn't mean I don't care about you. That doesn't mean you don't matter. That doesn't mean I don't want to help you in whatever way I can. Right? This is a very, very important uh, musr. Now, <laughs> this was an introduction. This wasn't even my topic, but I said I'm almost running out of time, but I just want to introduce a little bit. And that is, uh, the, one of the great dilemmas, maybe I'll have to have a part two sometime, but one of the great dilemmas in Kira Verchaikim uh, are the inyanim of Teichacha, and, uh, and how do you pace things? Meaning to say like this, we have a big Torah. The Torah has many, many mitzvos, many, many halachas. So of course, things that are chumras, of course, we're not gonna push on people, but, but things might be doraisa mitzvahs. And the question is, uh, when do we tell a person you gotta do everything? When don't we tell a person? So, because the problem we have is this. On the other hand, on one hand, if you're a Jew, you're chayev to do mitzvahs immediately. The day that you recognize it, you're chayev in all mitzvahs. On the other hand, experience shows that if a person moves too quickly, a person takes on too much, or a person takes on more than they're emotionally able to take on, what often happens is they may get a nervous breakdown, and the anxiety that they experience may be so overpowering that they may drop everything. In other words, that the things that they would have kept had we gone gradually uh, is uh, something that they will not be able to keep if you go full steam ahead. So we have to differentiate two matzavim. Matzav number one is, when can I hold back from telling them that something is sinful? That's a shevi al When can I keep quiet? They're doing different stuff that are wrong. I'll keep quiet. So on that shayla, we have many Makairas that there is a Makam to keep quiet. And again, unfortunately, this would need a whole, a whole long share. Maybe the Orla Gola share on Monday night will go over it. But here we have things like better to be a Shogeg than a Meza, meaning if he's going to violate, he doesn't know it's, uh, it's, it's Usher. If I tell him it's Usher, he's going to violate it anyway. So there is a principle better that a person be a Shogeg rather than a Meza. That's one principle. There's another principle that says, the same way there's a mitzvah to say things that will be listened to, there's a mitzvah not to say things that will not be listened to. Now I understand that the Ramah says that the principle that it's better to be a shogig than a mezid does not apply to prohibitions that are explicit in the Torah. But still the Mephoshim say that that can only apply to a person who accepts the Torah. I Meaning if someone hasn't yet accepted the Torah, there is no such thing as explicit in the Torah. So the bottom line is, and again, I, I, I apologize, this needs much further development, is there is 100% a heter not to tell people that certain things are us or and not to demand or, or even urge them to give, give it up. Uh, because once again, mutafshu shaygo yemiziden, is a davr shalom nishma, etc. Where you get into a much more delicate, difficult problem is not simply the inaction of not telling them or not pushing it, but where you yourself are either telling the person to continue this because you think it's psychologically better, or you are causing the sin. Now, one classic example, it's only one example of many, is inviting a person for Shabbos when you know they're going to drive. Now here, you're not just dealing with not giving tochacha. Here, you're actually causing somebody to do an avera. 
you're causing somebody to do it. And so you're dealing with something much more serious, a negative commandment in the Torah. Lifne iver, lo sitein michshol. Do not cause another Jew to sin. Do not put a stumbling block, right? So uh, you have an issue of inviting somebody for Shabbos if they're going to drive. Or you have another issue, giving food to somebody who's not going to make a bracha. The Shulchan Aruch actually says you're not allowed to give food to somebody who's not going to make a bracha because you're causing them to sin by not making a bracha. You're Now this is very different than the principles of better to be a shogig and not a mason. Those principles refer to what I don't have to tell a person. Okay, I don't have to tell them certain things. But here, I'm actively causing these Averis to be done. So you're no longer dealing with what do you tell a person. You're dealing with, I'm telling a person to do things that are wrong. Uh, I'm, I mean, Rav Moshe even calls that a mesis. <laughs> he says, Rav Moshe actually, it's a big chiddish Rav Moshe. Most people don't agree with him. But he says, the prohibition of mesis, enticing, is not only for Rabbi Dezara, it's even for any Isser. So Lamaisa, I remember, Many, many years ago, uh, more than 50 years ago, in yeshiva, uh, I was a single bucker in yeshiva. We had heard that Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach had issued a secret letter that was only available to Or Sameach, that nobody has ever seen this letter before. We talked about this in Er Yisrael, uh, that said, you're allowed to invite people who will drive on Shabbos as long as you offered them a place to stay. But this was a secret letter that nobody was allowed to, to read. Now, the truth is, it's not, it is not a, such a secret letter today. It's the Simon Aleph of Minchat Shlomo. It's in his Chuvas. Indeed, it was to Rabbi Michal Shon, uh, who has uh, worked here in Ar Sameach for many years. And let me just explain the general approach that Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach has. Rav Shlomo Zalman has a very interesting chiddish in the concept of Lifne Iver. Chazal have two different drashos for Lifne Iver. One drasha is, don't give people bad advice, generally. And the second drasha is, don't cause people to sin. Right? Don't be a gairem of Avera. Says Rav Shlomo Zalman, instead of looking at this as two different drashas, it's all one drasha. The reason I can't cause you to sin is because sinning is bad for you, and I'm not supposed to give you an eitzah that's bad for you. So says Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach, what if not causing him to sin is going to cause a greater sin in the future? So Rav Shlomo Zalman said, you're allowed to be machshil somebody in a smaller avera if al yedei kach, you will be monea the person from a bigger avera. Now let's take the two examples. I have uh, a repairman who comes in a day like today, very, very hot. He's going to repair my air conditioning. But he's not from, he's a chiloni. So, according to the literal reading of the Shulchan Aruch, I'm not allowed to offer him a glass of water because he's not going to make a bracha. And let's assume he would resent my suggesting that he make a bracha. So I'm not allowed to give him with me either. What is that chiloni going to think about a Jew, a religious Jew, who does not offer him water when it's 95 degrees? outside. He's going to think, oh, religious Jews are selfish. He's going to, he's going to come to hate Tyra. That's what Shlomo Zalman's lesson. He's going to be a Sinei Asa To be Sinei Asa is much, much worse than the chait of not making a bracha rishayna on food. Mimela, if the reason why I can't be machshel yu b'chait is because it's an eitzah she'enu hogenes here, Doing the lesser evil is actually considered an Eitzah Hygienesli. So if Shlomo Zalman said, Bismana Zat, you certainly offer non-religious people uh, food. And of course, we have the same Shaila and Kirov here. I mean, uh, here, I think, within a yeshiva, we, I think we, we do have the freedom to say, make a bracha. But there are some people who, you know, they may come here and they're, you know, they're still hostile about making brachas. We're allowed to feed them. We're allowed to feed them. What's they going to think? We serve, we serve food at the table. Oh, you don't get, you know, you don't make a bracha. What, what, how's, the guy gonna, how's the guy going to think? Now, the same cheshman applies with the invitation for Shabbos. And that is, and again, it's a little tricky. If you're inviting a person for a purely social event, let's get together and, you know, just hang out, that may be different. But if it's part of trying to bring a person to Torah, so just like Chazal say, by pikuach nefesh, Desecrate one Shabbos. 
in order that many Shabbos would be kept, the same thing here. Now, now again, let me point out, Shlomo Zalman makes it very clear. This is very important, Chilak. This is not a hetter for you to be Mechalel Shabbos, to be Makarif people. But when it's a Lifne Iver problem only, when it's causing somebody else who is not a Shemer Shabbos, it may be Kedai to have a smaller Michshel. Because again, it's a Lifne Iver problem. So the question is, is it, is it an Eitzah Hagenes or an Eitzah She'ena Hagenes? Now, there is a machlok, and by the way, although Shlomo Zalman was, I think, the first public matter of this, and he gave different conditions. You have to offer him a place to stay that has to be comfortable. Uh, you have to tell him that we would prefer you to stay for Shabbos. But even if they say they're going to drive after the fact, you do not withdraw the invitation. This is what he said. Now, following Rav Shlomo Zalman, we have Rav Moshe Sternbach. Rav Moshe Sternbach is hardly a mako. He's very machmer in many, many things. Rav Moshe Sternbach says, Beferish. You can invite. Invite people. Now, where you get an interesting machlokas is this stuff, where you get a bit, bit of machlokas among even the matirim is, well, if this is part of a tachnit, where I'm trying to introduce the person to mitzvos and to Shabbos, so it's part of a plan, that's one thing. But what if it's a one-time social event? I'm inviting him to my kid's bar mitzvah. I'm inviting him uh, just because my, he knows my mother-in-law who happens to be in town. Meaning, you're not planning on working with him. You're not planning on being makare for him. Right? And that, you don't have the rationale of chalel alav Shabbos achas, kedei sheyishmer Shabbos asharve, because you're not working in that miskeret. So here, Rav Asher Weiss actually says that you can make this cheshben even with respect to this very Shabbos itself. Because what's going to be? I caused the guy to drive. Okay, I caused the guy to drive to my house. Okay, but now he's going to spend three or four hours in my house with Kiddush, Birka Samazan. What would he be doing if I wouldn't invite him to my house? He would be Mechal Shabbos in other ways, and he might be Mechal Shabbos in many more ways. So Rav Ashravai says, the chalel of Shabbos Achas, k'day sheyishma Shabbosos Harbe, is lavdafka, it'll lead to Shabbosos Harbe. For this Shabbos Kufa, there's a tayelis. Given the reality that if I don't invite him, he's going to be Machal Shabbos anyway. So what are you going to start calculating? Uh, distances? Oh, let's see. Um, he's... 40 kilometers from the beach, and, you know, 35 to my, I mean, you know, you're not going to look at the trip. I mean, you're going to look at overall, there's going to be a Chilol Shabbos. And here, L'chol HaPachas, there will also be a Chilol Shabbos, but that would happen anyway on some level. And, and your Mitzarev, the mitzvahs and the Torah that he's going to absorb. So it's a difficult shikol because once again, uh, all the Gedolim tell us, we're not supposed to cut corners. I mean, you can't be makar of people to Torah by, by not keeping the halacha. You have to keep the halacha. But the halacha itself, in Lifnei Iver, Rav Shlomo Zalman says, is based on the yesoid of Eitzah Hagenes, Eitzah She'ena Hagenes. And in many cases, there, there may be a cheshven that it's kedai to let the person be Iver, uh, one Avera, if that will lead to a greater benefit. And there, there's actually a raya from Rebbe Kivager as well. Uh, to this Yisait, that uh, in Lifnei Iver at least, better to be machsho, a small, again, even let's talk about the literal meaning of the Pasuk. Don't put a stumbling block in front of a blind man. Although it's a machlekes rishaynim, if Lifnei Iver applies to the literal case. It's a machlekes. If I put a stumbling block in front of a blind man, am I over on Lifnei Iver? Some say I'm not. Some say the Pasuk is bedafka the drasha. But let's imagine that a blind man who can't see is walking towards a pit. That's deep. And if, God forbid, he falls into the pit, he may very well die. So I push him so he trips on a piece of wood. And he hurts himself. So I caused him to hurt his leg. But I caused him to hurt his leg to be my him from falling into the pit. But Shlomo Zalman says, it's a dover pushet that you could be machshel him with a small michshel in order to be minei a bigger michshel. And that would be the great shaila we would have in terms of kira for Shabbos, uh, food without a bracha. Uh, even like, uh, I mean, again, many, many cases. Uh, Masader Kedushin for a, a, a couple that does not keep Taras and Mishpacha. 
right? So they're going to live benida, and you're sanctifying the marriage, right? Are you allowed to marry them? So one psak is Rav David Cohen in, in Flatbush says, hey, they live out of wedlock anyway, so you're marrying them is actually not causing an Avera because they would do it anyway. That's actually a good smara. But even if they're old-fashioned in the sense that they're not going to be together until they get married, and you are the one marrying them, so l'chaira, you might taina, I'm causing sin. So again, the psak once again is, well, if the Orthodox rabbi is not going to marry them, they'll go to conservative, they'll go to reform, and that, will create, that could create a whole big shaykhaz. So you have to look at the consequences, not just the immediate short-term act. So once again, uh, if al yedei kach, there could be a a Hatsola could be, doesn't mean there will be, could be, then it might be Kedai. So, Lo Basi Yalla Lahayar, obviously, uh, these are very delicate shilas. That's why anybody in Kirif needs a Rav, needs a Posek uh, that they go to. Uh, so, nothing I say is, is Halacha Lamaisa Mamish, other than what, what I said, Beferish from, from, from the Paiskim. But this is going to be a very, very delicate Cheshman. When can you even encourage something that is technically an Avera if you feel there's going to be a long-term Tayelis, one of the biggest, most difficult Shailas uh, in Kirov. As I say, this is a different Shaila than the Shevi Altasa of when do I not tell them. When I don't tell them, that's the sugya of better to be a Shogig and not a Mezid. That's a separate sugya. But when you're actively encouraging a sin, that's a Shaila of Lifneiver. That's a more Chamar Dika Shaila. And then you have to weigh the consequences uh, very clearly. So, be uh, Hashem, we should all be zaycha uh, to grow in our own avida. And oh yes, I, yes, I, want, I do want one, one very quick story. I have to end with this quick story because this is such a beautiful story. When Ravaji Yosef was nifter, so uh, somebody was taking a bus. From, they were coming from Beersheba to Yerushalayim, and they were sitting next to someone who looked like a very chashuv He had a beker, he had a hat, a uh, beard, a chashuv person, a safer. And this hush of a person was crying uncontrollably. So the person sitting next to him said, uh, well, we lost the great Godel, but are you a Karav? I mean, uh, well, I mean, you seem to be crying even more than most people. He said, I want to tell you a story. He says, I was a street urchin. I was raised by a single parent, by my mother. My father was out of the picture. And I wasn't, I mean, I came from a Sorati home, like Sorati do, but I was not a, I was not a Shomer Shabbos. And I used to play soccer every Shabbos. Uh, on Shabbos, and one time uh, I kicked the ball, and there was a man with a hat who came, and it, the ball, you know, knocked off his hat. It was a vajah. And uh, I said to him, the man, you know, I was a chmachutzif, hey, give me back the ball, you know, give me the ball. So Ravajah said to him, he says, what's your name? So he says, my name is uh, Yitzi, whatever his name was. So Ravajah says, uh, did you have lunch yet? He said, no. He says, come to my house, let's, let's, let's eat together. Mm -hmm. So he comes to Ravaja's house, they have a meal, Ravaja makes Kiddush and you know, everything, they talk, they schmooze, they really didn't learn, they just, they just schmooze, Ravaja was such a machinistic masmid for Ravaja not to learn for a few hours, it was a big, big sacrifice. Now here's the amazing story, that's Mavil. He asked the kid, what do you normally do Saturday afternoon? He says, so very defiantly, I go to the movies, I go to the Edison Theater, you know, the Edison Theater, so the building is still there in Gaula, it used to be a movie theater. I go to the Edison Theater. Ravad just said, who probably was never in the Edison Theater in his life, I'm sure he was never in the theater. He said, how much does it cost? The kid said, whatever it was. Ravad just said, listen to this, go to the drawer there, take out the money, and go to the theater, just come back for shoulder shittas. And the person said, I went to his house for a year, every Shabbos, and every Shabbos he would tell me to take the money to go to the movie theater. Then after a year, he says, you know, listen, Shabbos afternoon, a long time. You know, before you go to the movies, we can learn a little bit. Huh? Let's learn some chumash together, whatever it is. So they learned chumash together. Then Rabbi said, you know, you're learning Torah already. You need to go to the movies, but you can learn a little more, Mishnah, etc." And lat lat, the person stopped going to the movies. He became much more Shomer Shabbos. And eventually, he went to yeshiva, eventually he became a Dayan in Beersheba. He was actually a Dayan. He was on the base in Beersheba. And he said, Rabbi Vajra was my father. I didn't have a, a father that I knew. Rabbi Vajra was my father in Ruchmias, for sure, and in Gashmias, too. He took care of me, you know, economically, you know, what I needed, and, and the like. And he said, 
if Rabbi Roger would have just... Now, imagine that first encounter. He gets hit with a soccer ball. <laughs> he could have just said, no, Shegetz, get out of here. What's that? Whatever smart I'm saying. Shegetz is Yiddish, but whatever he says. No, get out of here. And that would have been the end. That would have been this guy's life. The rest of his life would have been whatever it would have been. Rabbi just said, here's an neshama. I can help. I can show chesed to. I can show love to. And in that way, this person's life changed, and of course, his whole family changed, and the person became a, a dayan, the head of a basin, um, you know, one who's Marbit's Torah. And all because Rav Avadja opened his heart to this person. Rav Avadja was already, he was much younger then, but he was still already uh, known as a godal and known as a phenomenal Talmud Chacham. So it just shows you the amazing potential that is out there if we do it in a non-condemning, non-negative way, and we give people time, the time to change, the time to change instead of forcing things before they're ready. And la'at, la'at, real progress is gonna be made. Thank you.